Hi, my name is Adrian Jimenez, and I'm a student at Portland State University studying in the departments of geology and mathematics. This year, I was awarded a star award from the Oregon Space Grant Consortium to look at the applications of isotope hydrology and geochemistry to various NASA missions. I ended up focusing specifically on the science mission directorate and its concerns with the global water cycle and just looking at water quality and quantity in the coming years due to climate change. And so today I'm just going to talk to you about the basics of what isotope hydrology and geochemistry are, and then a couple of different applications that I think might be relevant to NASA's mission. So let's start by just talking about what isotope geochemistry is. It's a subdiscipline of the larger earth sciences that specifically looks at the ratios and concentrations of different isotopic species, be they in rocks or lava or water or even man-made materials like plastics. So today we're specifically gonna look at water and that's what this diagram on the left shows is how different isotopic species and their concentrations change as water travels through the water cycle. And the main drivers of this are the basic water cycle that we're all familiar with from precipitation to evaporation and then precipitation again, so on and so forth. Um, a little bit less, a little with a little bit smaller effect, but still important is freezing and melting and then also groundwater infiltration. And so what this diagram is showing is how the light isotopes have a tendency to concentrate in water vapor and the heavy isotopes have a tendency to concentrate in more tightly compacted materials like water and ice and snow. And so the reason for this is that the intermolecular forces and the bond strengths between light isotopes are a little bit weaker than those between heavy isotopes due to the difference in mass. And so as, say, a liquid water body, like a river or maybe a puddle or something, is evaporating, those it's going to be much easier for the bonds between the light molecules to break than the bonds between the heavy molecules because the forces are just a little bit weaker. And so as that water body evaporates, the light isotopes are going to concentrate, they're going to be more readily removed from the liquid, and they're going to concentrate in the vapor. And that's going to result in a, a vapor that's more heavily concentrated in the light isotopes and a liquid that's more heavily concentrated in the heavy isotopes. And then as that vapor travels along through the water cycle and experiences precipitation, um, because liquid is a more tightly compacted version of water, the heavy isotopes, which are more, more readily attracted to each other in that way, are actually going to concentrate in the liquid, resulting in a vapor that is even more concentrated <clears throat> in the light isotopes and a precipitation that's even more concentrated in the heavy isotopes. The same idea applies to freezing and melting. If you have like a lake and it freezes over in the winter, the solid layer on top is going to be more concentrated in the heavy isotopes while the liquid beneath is going to be more concentrated in the light isotopes. And the way that we measure these isotopic ratios principally is just with basic mass spectrometry. But a little bit more specialized than that is this machine that you see here, which is a Picaro water sampler, which is a mass spectrometer, but it's specifically designed for the measurement of water isotopes. And so the one problem with this, though, is that mass, mass spectrometry, the machines are, they have, they're kind of finicky. Um, so like in the lab, it, even just a slight temperature change in the lab could lead to drastically different results when even measuring the exact same sample. And so the way that hydrologists came up with to combat this is using water of known composition standards. Um, the most common of which is Vienna standard mean ocean water, which is just the average measurements of ocean water from around the world. <clears throat> and so these samples are specially prepared and we know the isotopic composition of them, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, by running that alongside whatever sample you're 
trying to measure, you can look at the results and look at the error associated with the standard. And because you know the composition of it, you can apply that same error to the sample that you were trying to run, trying to actually measure the unknown sample. And you can figure out roughly the actual composition of that sample. Um, because you ran them at the exact same time, the same error should apply. And <clears throat> these ratio measurements are reported as the difference between the measurement of your sample compared to what you measured of the standard of known composition. And typically we look at the per mil or parts per thousand concentration of the heavier isotopes hydrogen 2 and oxygen 18. <clears throat> um, a little bit less commonly, some hydrologists do use hydrogen 3, tritium, um, for more specialized applications than we'll talk about today. So using these ratios, we can generate what are called meteoric water lines. And so this is just by plotting the measurements of hydrogen 2 versus the measurements of oxygen 18. These symbols that you see on these axes are lowercase Greek letter deltas, which just represent that ratio I was talking about on the last slide of the difference between the measured standard and the measured sample. And so the black line here is here just labeled meteoric water line, but it represents what's called a global meteoric water line. And this was generated decades ago by a hydrologist who basically took measurements and took data from around the world of precipitation, surface water, basically all meteorically derived water, and graphed it and came up with this very nice linear trend line. And so by in doing that, he generated something that we could compare localized data to, comparing it to global average data. And so looking at this, for example, this line that someone plotted of measurements from the Rio Grande, um, looking at the slope of it, we can compare the slope of this line to the slope of the global meteoric water line. And what that tells us is how much evaporation our water body has experienced. So because the slope of the Rio Grande line is below that of the, meteor of the global meteoric water line, that tells us that the Rio Grande has experienced some level of evaporation and can act and actually with some more co complicated analysis, you can determine what percent of that water body has evaporated. And that can help you look at things like we'll talk about later with like lake stagnation. If a water body is stagnating, it's going to experience a really extreme amount of evaporation. And you'll have a slope drastically below that of the global meteoric water line to indicate that. And uh, just some terminology, these lines that you see here in color, the Rio Grande, Amazon, Darling, those are local meteoric water lines, just to indicate that you're looking at localized data, not global data. So let's talk about some applications. So one is catchment scale pollution transport. And so a water catchment is basically just any geographic region where precipitation is all collecting in a common source. So like here, we have precipitation in this area and it's all gonna collect in these water bodies here. And so in a catchment, you can have like, if there's you know some population around here somewhere, you might have pollution being generated into that river or into that lake. And so for example, like plastic particles, we, I'm sure we've all heard about microplastics and their propagation through the environment. Um, one theoretic model says that we can actually look at the way that plastics travel through the environment, similar to the way sediments travel through the environment, like sand and dirt and stuff like that. Um, the problem with this is that plastics, their physical properties are much more varied than that of sediments. And so, Unfortunately, we need to do more research and data validation and stuff to actually determine this, but some isotope tracers, carbon-13 and nitrogen-15, 
are really useful in tracking sediment transport. And so if we're able to validate that plastic pollution travels through the environment similar to sediments, these stable isotope tracers will be really useful to, tra to track the way that plastic travels through aquatic environments. Um, in other ways, uh, looking at like river interactions and lakes and stuff, isotope tracers can actually help you determine the way that water bodies interact with each other and mix together. So like at the confluence of two major rivers, for example, in Portland, between the Columbia and the Willamette, taking measurements from upstream and then from downstream after they mix together, you can determine the specific areas of the rivers that different water sources end up. And so by modeling this, if you come up with a detailed model of how all of these water bodies interact, if you identify a source of some aquatic pollutant like oil or something like that, you could really quickly determine where it's gonna end up, which can help you mitigate harm much more rapidly. And so another application of this is lake health. Like I mentioned before, we can use isotopes and the evaporation rates and stuff like that to determine the health of a lake ecosystem and whether or not it's stagnating. And so one example is research that I and my mentor for this project are actually doing at Sturgeon Lake, which is on Savi Island, just northwest of Portland, Oregon. Um, and we're using stable isotope tracers to track a bunch of things like the evaporation rates, how much water is ending up in the lake from different tributaries, and overall residence time of the lake, which is just a quantification of how long a how long different water molecules stay in the body after they enter it. So Sturgeon Lake, um, in this map up here, you can see on the right is the Columbia River, and the top of the map is north, and we have Sturgeon Lake over here. And so sev several years ago, a local government agency, the West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District, determined that Sturgeon Lake was stagnating and experienced extreme sedimentation due to blockage in this creek right here, which was a major source of water entering from the Columbia River. And Sturgeon Lake is a super important ecosystem. It, it's one of the most important stopovers in the Pacific Flyway, which is a migratory bird path all the way from Canada to Mexico. Um, and houses like 200,000 or something, even just geese <laughs> over the summer months. And that's not even looking at other waterfowl and other migratory birds. Um, and alongside that, it's also really important for salmon populations as juvenile salmon travel along the river. They are able to come in through this creek and kind of rest up and feed in this lake and bulk up before they reach the ocean, which improves their chance of survival. Obviously, with a blocked creek, they're not able to do that. And so the West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District worked to dredge out this canal and reshape it. So originally, Dairy Creek went kind of straight through, and they dredged this canal and reshaped the creek to try to prevent sedimentation. And so after that, we started using state... There was actually a student prior to me who did a stable isotope study of how much Columbia River water was entering the lake and a bunch of different parameters of the lake ecosystem prior to them doing this restoration work. So we have that data set, and now we're collecting data after the restoration to determine how much more Columbia River water is entering the lake and how much less evaporation it may be experiencing. And so in doing that, we can determine how much more flushing flow is entering the lake and moving it around and preventing it from stagnating and having large deposits of sediment settle in it. Uh, and this map below shows the distribution of our sampling sites. And these blue diamonds right here are where we're sampling surface water. Down here are the Columbia and Willamette rivers. So that's helping us determine how much of those river waters are entering the lake. And then this chunk right here is all sampling sites on the actual lake. That helps us determine what parts of the lake water is ending up in. These kind of outlier points in green around here are <clears throat> precipitation sampling sites. And you can't really see it very well, but there's actually one on the island right here as well. And so those help us determine the evolution in isotopic composition as air masses move from the ocean 
across to the Cascades. And as they move across that path, they're going to travel over the island and rain into the lake. So that's helping us determine one more source of water in the lake. And by having all of that data, we can actually determine the residence time of the lake, which is a very important parameter to determining overall evaporation rates and how healthy the lake ecosystem is. And this sort of precipitation data is actually extremely important for a lot of different hydrologic projects. Um, the International Atomic Energy Agency actually hosts a widespread global network of precipitation sampling sites so that hydrologists don't have to incorporate this into their studies. They can just use existing data because as you can see, this study site would be much smaller if we didn't need to use these precipitation sites. Unfortunately, coverage from this is very minimal in the United States. And so part of this project is we're trying to raise awareness of how important it is to have this kind of data and to also have this data for this region that we can publish and provide to hydrologists in this area that might be studying things that this data would be important for. So that's isotope hydrology, just a few applications of it. Um, thank you for listening. And if you have, have any questions, because this isn't a live presentation, I encourage you to email me at this address, and I'm happy to take any questions about this presentation. Thank you.